so much of your attention. You can't write something. You can't focus on your work. You can't do anything if you follow your breath properly. It is impossible. And in fact, this passage right here is really all we need to know that this argument is flawed because this passage says that when you are working, yeah, I'm talking now about the other sutta I was mentioning that is from the numerical discourses, the six is number 29. It says when you work, you are mindful of your work. When you walk, you're mindful of your walking. When you're sitting, you're mindful of sitting. When you work, of working. In other words, whatever we're doing, that is what you're mindful of. And when you sit down to meditate, when you close your eyes, uh, you clear your mind out, you establish mindfulness, that is when you are aware of the breath. Uh, you're not aware of the breath through daily activities. Uh, in fact, I know someone, I know a person who tried this idea of always being aware of the breath. Uh, he was a monk. He was a monk in Sri Lanka. And he told me that he was kind of, he was walking Pindavat, yeah, a very traditional thing in all, uh, in Buddhist countries, you have your arms bowl and you walk through the village or the town and people put food in your bowl. Yeah, it's a very beautiful practice if you've ever done that. It's really, really nice and very kind of touching practice uh, when you do Pindavat. And, it, and uh, it's kind of generosity going both ways in a sense between the monastics and the lay people. In this case, the, the lay people are being generous. So. And he said that while he was walking on Pindavat, he decided, I will watch the breath all the time. Yeah, while walking Pindavat. And he said he was walking down the street, and suddenly he had no idea where he was. <laughs> he had walked down the wrong street, yeah, <laughs> because his attention on the breath was so strong. He had no idea what was going on anymore. He was completely lost. That is the downside of, <laughs> of watching your breath too much and not knowing the right time to do this kind of thing. So, so I think this is a, um, one of the uh, important, one of the ideas behind this particular passage is simply to be aware of what you're doing. Yeah? And this is one of the things you will hear from someone like Ajahn Brahm. Yeah? Ajahn Brahm says, whatever you do, give it 100%. Uh, yeah? This is one of the things that you hear also from uh, people like Ajahn Brahm's teacher, Ajahn Shah in Thailand. Yeah? Whatever you do, put all your attention into what you're doing. If you're going to sweep, put all your attention into the sweeping. If you're going to wash the dishes, put all your attention into washing the dishes. If you're going to give a Dhamma talk, put all your attention into giving the Dhamma talk. If you're going to listen to a Dhamma talk, put all your attention into listening to the Dhamma talk. If you're going to, whatever it is, that is where you put your attention. And I think this is the main idea behind this. Be present as much as you can. Why should we do this? What is the point of being present? Well, to understand what the point of being present is in this way, first of all, you have to understand the sequence here. Yeah? The sequence here is that this thing that we are looking at now, being aware of walking when you're walking and all of that, it actually belongs before the mindfulness of breathing. Yeah? This is part of the preliminary practices that lead to meditation. This in itself is not really a meditation practice because you're not sitting down, you're not watching the breath, you're, you're doing this in all kinds of situations. So this is actually before the mindfulness of breathing. Yeah? So what happens before mindfulness of breathing? Well, what happens before mindfulness of breathing is right effort. Yeah? Right effort leads to right mindfulness. Mindfulness of breathing is part of right mindfulness. So this must be before that. This is part of right effort, what leads up to mindfulness of breathing. So what is right effort about? Well, right effort really is about purifying our minds. Yeah? It is about stopping bad qualities from arising. It is about overcoming bad qualities that have already arisen. It is about building up good qualities. Yeah. That is what it is about. So when you see this kind of mindfulness, you know that the real purpose is to actually be aware of what is going on. And especially if you are in the present, if you don't allow the mind to deviate too much in all kinds of directions, you will also know what is happening in your mind at the same time. You know that you're walking, but you also know what's happening in your mind because you are here. And if you can see that you are getting 
angry about something, if you can see that you're getting some excessive desires about something, you can do something about it. Yeah, you have the ability to restrain yourself because you are present all the way throughout. And this is the point of right effort. This is the point of all the preliminary exercise that lead up to mindfulness of breathing is to clear the mind, to make the mind ready for real meditation practice. So what we are seeing here is not really meditation practice. This is right effort leading to meditation practice. And I will show this in more detail later on, but now it's just as a preliminary kind of idea just to show you what is going on here. So this is, I think, the purpose of these kind of things because it allows you then to purify yourself. And this is a very, very, very important point. And this is a point that I think is often not really fully understood in meditation circles. It is very common in meditation circles to say you should be mindful at all times. Yeah, always be mindful. Mindfulness is good. But I want to ask, well, why should we always be mindful? What is the purpose of this? If you are just mindful, but you don't use it for the correct purpose, is it going to do anything? You are going to be like that lady who was meditating for 10 years, always being mindful. And after 10 years, she gets addicted to television because you have been mindful, but you haven't done anything with the mindfulness. The mindfulness needs a purpose. And the purpose of mindfulness is to purify yourself. That is why it is called Sati Sampajanya, mindfulness and full awareness. That is the point of it. This is what sense restraint is about. This is why full awareness is all about. This is what this kind of practice is all about, is to purify the mind. So while you are walking, you have an awareness of what is going on in your mind. It helps you, that presence of mind, which is aware of the walking, that very presence helps you to understand what is happening in your mental state. So you can see the defilements if they are about to arise. When you see them as they are about to arise, you can do something about them. If you don't see them when they are about to arise, there's nothing you can do. Yeah, and then this, this then becomes very powerful. I'm going to talk more about this later on on this retreat, uh, but it becomes very powerful because then you can see a little bit of irritation or ill will arising, yeah? And then you say, stop. And then you can use an antidote, and I will talk about these antidotes later on. You can use an antidote to overcome that ill will. You can look at the other person in a different way here. You can look at that snake in a different way. Just yesterday, I saw a big snake in the monastery here, just in front of me, just a few meters away. And I saw the snake before the snake saw me, so I was very lucky. <laughs> so the snake kind of went away. But uh, so, uh, yeah, so I just, whoops, the snake kind of went off. And there's no, no need to get angry with a snake, actually. Much, much more likely you get angry with a person because people are more, uh, they are more, um, troublesome very often. Yeah? People, it's, it's strange. People are the things we love the most. They're also the mo things that are the most troublesome in life. Uh, that's usually how it is with people. So um, it allows you to stop that ill will from arising. It allows you to look at that person in, in a new way. It allows you to give rise to compassion instead of ill will. And this is really the power of this thing here. Yeah? So uh, then it says, whatever posture the body is in, they know it. Yeah? And this then includes working with something or whatever it is that you're doing. Yeah? And then the, the, the text says, as they meditate like this. And this is where I disagree with this translation because I don't take this to be meditation at all. And the reason why, this is Bhante Sujato's translation, the reason why he translates as meditate is because uh, the word here is viharati. Viharati means to dwell, and it is often used in the sense of meditation. But here, it doesn't mean meditation. It means more like as you live like this, yeah? as you act in this way. That's really what this is about. So this is how I understand this. As you live like this, yeah? diligent, keen, and resolute, uh, memories and thoughts of the lay life are given up because you are actively overcoming your defilements. Yeah? So these things are disappearing. And again, as you do that, down the track, 
the mind becomes stilled internally. It settles, unifies, and becomes stilled in samadhi. So again, you attain jhana states, you attain samadhi based on this. It is important here to understand, though, that the awareness of the bodily postures itself is not enough to give rise to jhana states, right? This is just a preliminary thing. It is a preliminary thing that leads you to purify yourself. And just like with the breath meditation, the breath meditation we saw before, we only saw the beginning of the breath meditation, not the whole sequence. In the same way here, we only see the beginning of what you have to do, not the whole sequence that actually leads to jhana states. But what we are seeing is the most significant part, the part that overcomes the hindrances, allows you to stay with the breath, allows you to stay with the metta object, whatever it is, and then samadhi, stillness of the mind, comes as a consequence. So in that sense, very useful. So how, how do you apply this in your everyday life? And the way to apply this in your everyday life, as I said before, is just to fully focus on what you're doing. Don't allow yourself to multitask too much. Multitasking is a very bad idea. Focus on what you're doing. Don't allow your mind to become too distracted by your, you know, by whatever devices that you're using. Turn your devices off. Be wise in how you use the electronic devices that we have these days. Turn your mobile phone off sometimes, yeah? So you can focus on what you're doing. If you're allowing yourself to be distracted by incoming messages and things all the time, you will never be able to be, have this kind of mindfulness. Check your emails, only check your emails once every few hours. Don't check it all the time. Don't allow messages to interrupt you all the time. Turn those notifications, turn all the notifications off, yeah? When you do this, when you are wise about how you use the kind of modern communications, then you can become much more settled. You can focus much more on what you're doing. I really recommend you to do this. I think people are far too accepting of being interrupted by these kind of communications all the time. And it leads to a poverty on the spiritual path. It leads to you becoming scattered. It leads to you inability to really focus on what is going on. And that is very, very detrimental. So try to be wise about these things. And as you do that, you will actually benefit, I think, enormously from that. So that is the little passage on the postures, the four postures. And this passage belongs in this sutta. It belongs before the mindfulness of breathing, but it belongs right here. It is part of the kaya, gata, sati, the mindfulness directed to the body. It does not really belong in the Satipatthana Sutta, because Satipatthana is really all about meditation practice proper. Yeah? This belongs before meditation. And I will show you later on during this retreat that the Satipatthana Sutta actually uh, is actually the way the Buddha taught it and the way we have it now are probably quite different. And this particular part does not actually belong to the Satipatthana Sutta. And I will give you some very, I think, powerful evidence why that is the case. So now we can move on. Um, how, yeah, so we have another 10 minutes before we get to four o'clock. Okay, good, just trying to understand. <laughs> Remember where we are going for time. So now we come to the third exercise of the Kaya Gata Sati Sutta. And this here uh, is the one which is about Sati Sampajanya, a very interesting part of the Buddhist teachings, uh, often translated as mindfulness and full awareness. Uh, here it is translated as, uh, actually this is only about Sampajanya. Sati is not part of this one right here. So Sampajanya. And uh, usually full awareness or clear comprehension. Here it is translated as situational awareness. Uh, and situational awareness is actually a very good translation for what is going on here. This is quite an interesting passage. So let me read this out for you and then we will discuss it in a second. So uh, furthermore, 
a monastic acts with situational awareness when going out and coming back, when looking ahead and looking aside, when bending and extending the limbs, when bearing the outer robe, bowl and robes, when eating, drinking, chewing and tasting, when urinating and defecating, when walking, standing, sitting, sleeping, waking, speaking and keeping silent. And as they live like this, not meditate, but as they live like this, diligent, keen and resolute, memories and thoughts of the lay life are given up. The mind becomes stilled internally, settled, unified, and it becomes immersed in samadhi. That too is how a monastic develops mindfulness of the body. So uh, again, uh, this is all about situational awareness. I should maybe make the point straight away that it says throughout here, it says a mendicant or a monastic. Yeah? The Pali word is bhikkhu, which liter literally means a monk. Yeah? But uh, it is important to remember that when a Buddha speaks to a monk in this way, what he means is really everyone. Everyone is included in this. Nuns are certainly included. Lay people are also included. Yeah, you are not exempt. You are not outside of the, the good company. As long as you are one of the four parises, the four paris are the four assemblies in Buddhism, you also are spoken to when the Buddha speaks these things. It's a very important point. It's the way the Buddha speaks. He always speaks to the bhikkhus because the bhikkhus, the monks, they are the most senior people present, but everyone is really included in this. So here we have this idea of acting with situational awareness. Sampajana kari is the Pali word. And uh, the things that you see in this sequence of things here, it may seem strange. Yeah? What are these things? Going out, coming back, looking ahead, looking aside, bending and extending the limbs. It seems a bit random, doesn't it? It seems a bit, what, what, what are all of these things? Bearing the outer robe and bowl? Well, we can sort of assume it is mostly to monastics because it talks about bearing the robes and the bowl, but still it also applies to lay people. So because this is mainly meant for monastics, and we can see that right there because of the robe and the bowl, what this is, this is all the activities that a monastic does outside of meditation practice, outside of living in the monastery. Yeah? These are the things they do, especially when they go on arms round, going out, coming back, looking aside. Yeah? Are they going to give food or are they not going to give food? Bending and extending your limb. If they're going to give food, you extend your limbs and you hold out the bowl and you receive the food. Yeah? Bearing the robe and the bowl, this is what you do when you go for arms round. So these are the activities that you do outside of the ordinary activities. It is the various kind of situations that you find yourself in in daily life. It is the various kind of situations. That's why situational awareness is just right. Yeah? It is the awareness of the situation that is going on. And this, so this is a very important uh, part of what is happening here. And. Um, so what exactly is the point of this situational awareness? Why are we supposed to be aware in this way? What exactly do we get out of this? Yeah, and to understand this, and this is actually quite interesting. This is something that I think everyone can really take back and use as part of your practice. This is where the commentaries give a very reasonable understanding of what is going on. And what the commentary says is that the purpose of this situational awareness, Sampajanya, is twofold. It's actually fourfold, it says, but two of the main things is we understand the purpose of the activity that we're doing, and we understand the suitability of that activity. Yeah, so as a monk or a nun, you go into the village. Actually, there's no village here in Australia. We just kind of hang out in the monastery and all the lay people come to the monastery here in Australia. 
It's, it's one of those amazing things, yeah, that in the monastery here, many of you have been to our monastery uh, and you know what it is like. And all these people come every day to the monastery to support the monks and support the monastic community. Uh, it's very beautiful. It's very kind of touching when that happens. Uh, and then they all come upstairs and they listen to Ajahn Brahm and Ajahn Brahm tells them a few stories, the latest joke, and <laughs> the latest story. And of course, there's also a little bit of Dhamma in that as well, right? Uh, and they listen and sometimes just being in the presence of a place where there is kindness, uh, there's a sense of peace, yeah? People love coming to the monastery. Uh, and there's this beautiful exchange between offerings on the one hand and then spiritual qualities coming back on the other hand. Uh, it's very, very powerful. Uh, I don't know, you, when you see this, when you feel it in the monastery, it feels like a very wholesome and very positive thing going on. Uh, so um, this is what we, how we do things here. We don't go into the village, but we have our own uh, way of doing things, which actually is very, very meaningful. Uh, but when you do go into the village, and when you do go on arms around, even in the monastery, you have to, why are you doing it? What is the purpose of what you're doing? Uh, and the purpose is to receive alms food so that you can sustain yourself for the rest of the day. That is why you go into the village. You don't go into the village to look at all the pretty girls, yeah, <laughs> or something like that. You don't go into the village to look at all the advertisements, yeah. Sometimes you have like all these fancy advertisements going on in the village. You don't go into the village to go to the cafe to have lots of cappuccinos or lattes or whatever it is that you get in the cafes. You go to the village to have, get your arms food. That means that you are restrained because you understand the purpose for where you're going. So you know the purpose of why you're doing things. You're looking ahead and looking aside. You're not looking aside to see something beautiful. You're looking aside to see if people are ready to offer arms. Yeah, you're stretching out your arms, not to touch someone inappropriately. You're stretching out your arms to receive arms food. That is what you're doing. So all of these things are done in the right way. You bear your robes and the bowls in the right way, in an appropriate way, well covered in body and all of these kind of things. The purpose, you are aware of the purpose all the way through. You're also aware of the suitability. Yeah, if there is some kind of festival going on in the village uh, and there's lots of kind of uh, amazing things happening in the village that are really beautiful and powerful, there's like a, whatever it might be, maybe that's the wrong day to go for alms food in that village. You go to another village. You do what is suitable. Uh, yeah? You look at your robes. Is this robe suitable? Am I wearing this robe because... Uh, it's a good robe, or am I wearing it because, yeah, this is the best kind of cloth. I only want the best robes, yeah? No one can give me any junk. I want the real deal. Am I wearing it because I am proud and I want the best, or am I wearing it for its real reason? This is what it means to be suitable and purposeful in how you live your ordinary life, yeah? It talks about eating, eating, drinking, chewing, yeah? You eat the right amount. You are mindful of what you're doing. You don't feel bloated all of a sudden and really overfull. You know what's going on. Yeah, you are aware when going to the toilet. That's kind of an interesting one. I'm not sure. I've always wondered exactly what that means. But you know what I think it means? I, I don't really see any very clear reason why you need to have a lot of clear comprehension. We're going to the toilet. I mean, going to the toilet is just going to the toilet. Yeah, it's kind of whatever. But I think it is there because it reminds you of the hum human body. This is the nature of the human body. This is what it's like to have a human body. You have to go to the toilet all the time. It is not something that we are proud of. Yeah? It is not something that we really talk about uh, because it is considered slightly yucky, slightly disgusting. Yeah? This body creates all of this yucky stuff. Uh, not something that we want to talk about. So it reminds you of the body. It gives a clarity about what the body actually is like. Yeah? And when you do that, of course, again, it reduces defilements. You have an, a suitability and purpose going on there. Huh? Then you have the next one here is 
clear awareness when walking, standing, sitting, sleeping, waking, speaking, and keeping silent. You speak for the right reason. You keep silent for the right reason. Yeah. You sleep and you are awake again in the right way. Yeah. And as you do that, uh, you know what is suitable, you know, the right amount of sleep, the right amount of being awake, the right amount to speak. You don't speak too much. I am just about to speak too much because I'm going over the time. So, <laughs> but, uh, so you understand all of these things, doing all of these things in the right way. And what you can see here, I think very obviously, is how this is not just useful for monastics, it is also very useful for lay people because all of these things should really be done in a purposeful and a suitable way. And then your life starts to revolve around the Dhamma. And when your life revolves around the Dhamma, then of course, that's when you start to make really good progress on the Buddhist path. There's, much, there's a bit more to be said about uh, situational awareness, but I will stop there because... Of and... Uh, so uh, we have just gone through all of these things. And uh, I just want to make the point again that uh, the uh, sleeping here, it says when sleeping, and it is impossible to have situational awareness when sleeping. So I think the correct translation is you have situational awareness about sleeping, about being awake, about speaking, about keeping silent. In fact, the idea of about goes all the way through this one. Instead of when, about should be put in there instead. So you have situational, situational awareness going back to the beginning now. You have situational awareness about going out and about coming back, about looking ahead and about looking aside, about bending and about extending the limbs, about bearing the outer robe, bowl, and robes, about eating, drinking, chewing, and tasting, about going to the toilet, about, and all of these things. So it's all about, it's, it's about, about, yeah? <laughs> it's about, which is the critical thing here. In other words, you know about the activity that you're doing, that you're doing it in, in the right way. It is not so much, as you were suggesting before, that you have awareness at all times, necessarily, it's good to have awareness at all times because the previous one is saying that. So you have awareness what's happening in your mind. But here it is more a broad idea that you know, am I doing this for the right reason? Should I really go to the casino? Is going to the casino a good idea? Or should I not go to the casino? Should I, you know, on the internet, should I watch these things on the internet? Or should I not watch these things on the internet? Is this a good idea or is it not? Etc. Etc. You understand, in other words, what gives rise to good states of mind and what gives rise to bad states of mind. If you spend too much time on social media, you probably get angry because there's so many bad stuff going on on social media. There are all these trolls out there and people giving you a hard time and people shouting at you and doing bad things. So sometimes you just leave out the, the social media and the internet and live a more simple kind of lifestyle so that you can have more peace of mind and you can have less troubles in your, uh, in your life. So this is very useful for lay people and for monastics alike. Yeah? You do things in the right way so as to optimize your spiritual practice. And uh, one of the important things about this passage that I haven't mentioned yet uh, is that this passage too belongs before the mindfulness of breathing, both this one and the previous one about the four postures, both of these are preliminary things that go before mindfulness of breathing, before satipatthana practice. If you look at the suttas in many places, you have what is called the gradual training, one thing coming after another, yeah? And in that gradual training, sampajanya, clear awareness, situational awareness, the thing that we are looking at now always comes before satipatthana practice, before mindfulness of breathing here. This is a way of helping you to prepare the mind to be ready for meditation practice. Yeah? This is very, very, very interesting. And I think very, 
important to understand because what this means is that if you take this as a preliminary practice, then you start to wonder, well, why then is this part of the Satipatthana Sutta? If it is prior to Satipatthana Sutta, how can it be inside the Satipatthana Sutta? What is going on here? And the answer is, and this is what I was talking about before, the answer is that some of these things have been added to the Satipatthana Sutta at a later date. The more you see kind of all the evidence in the suttas, the more clear this becomes. So this should really be taken out of the Satipatthana Sutta, put into a preliminary practice together with the four postures, and then we can start to understand how this unfolds. Yeah? You purify the mind through situational awareness by being aware of the four postures, understanding the content of your mind, countering the defilements of the mind until the mind is ready for meditation practice. And then when you start meditation practice, that is when you are doing Satipatthana. That is what Satipatthana is all about. It's about sitting down, being aware of the breath, doing uh, mindfulness of the body, any kind of meditation that you want to do, that starts only then. And um, this, this, I think, is very significant. It means that, you know, things that the thing that we are looking at now is not really called meditation at all. It is not part of meditation. It is part of a preliminary practice. And this idea that we very often have in Buddhism, that we do meditation in daily life, yeah, it comes from this. This is where it comes from. But it turns out to be wrong. It does not belong in meditation. It belongs prior to meditation. And this changes our attitude a little bit to the path. These things are still important, but they are important in a different way. They are not meditation practices in, the, in their own right. They are there to purify yourself, to make yourself ready for meditation, not an aspect of meditation. So once we understand this, the path becomes more clear. It becomes more clear what is preliminary and what is real meditation. Yeah? Things kind of fall into place in a beautiful way. So I think it is possible that for some of you this may not have been very clear because it is a little bit involved. But I will come back to this later on during this retreat. When we come to the Satipatthana Sutta, I will explain this again, but from the point of view of Satipatthana practice. And then hopefully it will become more clear what is going on when we do that. And then, as you says here, as you meditate, in other words, as you live in this way, I'm still on the same paragraph. Uh, diligent, keen, and resolute, uh, your memories and thoughts of the lay life are given up. Uh, in other words, you are giving up those defilements and attachments uh, that most people have uh, yeah, in their life. Uh, and because you are giving that up, then down the track, after practicing meditation, then you can achieve samadhi as a consequence. Yeah? Samadhi becomes possible. You become internally still, settled, and unified, uh, and uh, then uh, samadhi happens because of that. Uh, this too is how a mendicant develops mindfulness of the body through this idea of situational awareness. So uh, I hope you are okay with that. Um, I apologize a little bit for being a little bit too technical sometimes. But some of these things are actually very interesting. And I think if you hang in there, and especially when we come towards the end of the retreat, the last couple of days, these things will become much more clear what is going on. It's about getting the sequence right. It's about understanding what we actually have to do to make meditation work. And when we understand properly what it is that we have to do, then meditation will actually work. Yeah? Remember, the name of this course is Learning Meditation from the Buddha. This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to come back to what the Buddha actually was talking about. This is the purpose of all of this. And so by doing this, to have more clarity about the path, this is really what this ultimately is about. So uh, fortunately, on this retreat, there's lots of opportunities to ask questions and things. So please take that opportunity if we need to 
uh, clarify things. Uh, so now let us move on to the next one. Uh, the next, uh, this is also still about the uh, body. So we have the mindfulness directed to the body. And now we come to the 31, 32 parts, 31, 32 parts of the body. So uh, we'll see in a second how many parts there are here. Furthermore, a monastic examines their own body up from the soles of the feet and down from the tips of the hairs, uh, wrapped in skin and full of many kinds of filth. <laughs> a very funny translation of filth. In this body, there is head hair, body hair, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinews, bones, bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, diaphragm, spleen, lungs, intestines, mesentery, undigested food, feces, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, grease, saliva, snot, synovial fluid, and urine. So <laughs> there is that uh, long sequence uh, for you yeah, of uh, these parts of the body. And uh, uh, if you count, have you counted, have you counted those numbers? Uh, usually what I like to do at this point, uh, before anyone has the time to count, uh, I usually like to ask people, how many parts are there of the body? And uh, you should not count, you should, you should just guess from the top of your head. Uh, and you, 31 parts, okay, <laughs> great, okay, well done. Wow, that's pretty, pretty cool. Okay, excellent, 31 parts, right? I don't know if you counted or whether you or whether you actually knew that already. Because usually if you ask people, they will say 32 parts of the body. Almost everyone says 32 parts. So why do people say 32 parts? <laughs> okay, okay, great, good. So you, you, have, you, have, you know exactly what is going on. Exactly. The reason why people say 32 parts is because they add the brain. The brain is the, is the 32nd part. Why do they add the brain? The reason they add the brain is because the brain is found in the commentaries. If you go to the Visuddhimagga, which is the main commentary of the Theravada tradition, it is a big manual about meditation, all of that. It says 32 parts. For some reason, it adds the brain. Maybe they thought the Buddha wasn't good enough. Yeah, the Buddha had forgotten about the brain or something, so they wanted to add the brain. I don't know why they think like this, but that's how they think. And what is interesting about that, and what it shows us, is how dependent we often are on the commentaries for our understanding of the Dhamma. So much of the way that we read the suttas, it's filtered through the commentaries. The commentary is actually what gives us what is there, not actually what is on the page, but we understand it from the point of view of the commentaries. So people always say 32 parts because they have read a book somewhere, because they have been given a Dhamma teaching by somebody, because this, this is what has been passed down through the generation of monastics and lay people, 32 parts. And you never actually check how many parts there really are. There actually is only 31. And what, of course, it doesn't matter whether there's 31 or 32. It's completely irrelevant. If there's 29 or 26, good enough, or maybe 40, that's fine. The point is not that um, the number of body parts matter. That is not the point. The point is that we tend to understand the Dhamma through the commentaries. That means that you become careful, yeah? You become more careful when you start to read the Dhamma in the right way, and you start to ask yourself all these assumptions, all these things I have been told by reading books and by listening to Dhamma talks, etc. Is that what the Buddha actually is saying? Or could it be that the Buddha is saying something else? Yeah, you can start to understand the influence the power, the commentary, the sway the commentaries hold over our minds. Yeah, because we are so conditioned, understanding everything through the commentarial framework. 
So this is the sort of thing that opens your eyes. You think, wait a minute, maybe there are other things in the suttas that I have misunderstood. Maybe there are other things that actually the traditional Theravada way of looking at the suttas is actually a mistake. And of course, the answer is yes. There's plenty of things that are mistaken in the Theravada tradition. And I will point out at least one such thing right away. This is why I'm making so much of this, because I want to point out one such uh, problem right here in this very passage. Yeah, so uh, first of all, when we do this kind of contemplation, the thir 31 parts of the body, you will see here at the very beginning there, it says they examine their own body. Yeah? The Pali is imang evang kayang, which means this very body. In other words, this very body means my body. This is a very important part. So when we, if we are going to do the 31 parts of the body contemplation that we have here, we should always refer to ourselves, yeah? Because this is where the problem starts. It starts with attachment to our own body. There's a very interesting sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya. I think it's in the sevens or something like that. And it talks about how it is that we get attached to other people. Why is it that you are interested in having a boyfriend or a girlfriend? Why is it that you think a, a woman or a man is attractive? Where does that come from? And this sutta says it is because you find your own body attractive, first of all, because of your attachment to your own body, your own gender, to your own identity, that is why you get attracted to other people. The problem starts here. It starts with yourself, with who you are. And that's why when we do these kind of contemplations, we should always start with our own body, first of all. Then by doing it on your own body, you actually resolve much of the problem with attraction also outside. So you start with your own body. You go from the soles of the feet to the tips of the hairs. In other words, everything, yeah, everything that is part of this, wrapped in skin. This gives us the limit. It is only the physical body we're looking at, nothing more, full of many kinds of filth. This is asuchi. This literally means impurities in the Pali language. And uh, you can see why, yeah, when we look at all of these things, uh, these are not things that we find very attractive, yeah, kidneys and heart, yeah, liver, <laughs> diaphragm, it's all there, but it's not something that we find attractive in a human being. It is, if you, I always like to say, if you take the skin off a human being, a human being is not very interesting anymore. Without the skin, it's not the same. <laughs> and a body without the skin can be quite kind of repulsive. And uh, I, I mentioned this before many times, but I, there was one of these famous German um, people. He, was, he had this thing called Körperwelten, which means the world of bodies. His name was Günther von der Hagen, and he would take the skin off dead bodies, yeah? And then he had a special way of preserving the body. So after the skin was taken off, the body was preserved. And you can see all of these bodies without skin. It is, have you seen that? Have you, did you see that before? It is really kind of fascinating. Look it up on the internet. Günther, Günther von der Hagen was the name of the person. Körperwelten is the, I, I, maybe if you're interested, I can write down later on the, uh, the, the exact spelling for these things. And he had all these exhibitions. One of these exhibitions he had right here in Perth. Yeah. So we had, at the time, we had a global conference on Buddhism. And the exhibition from Günther von der Hagen was just next door. So we all went off to, <laughs> to look at this expedition. Yeah? We kind of got fed up with all the Dhamma talks. So we went to have a look at his bodies instead. <laughs> instead. No, I'm, I'm just joking. I'm exaggerating a bit. So we went to see this. And it's astonishing. When you take the skin off a body, it looks very, very different. It is very unattractive, yeah? And this is why the Buddha says here, if you look at the body in the right way, actually, it is beauty is only skin deep. Beauty relies entirely on the skin. Take away the skin, everything is really gone. There's nothing there of any interest anymore when you take the skin away. 
So this is the idea of filth. Yeah, I think the word filth is maybe a little bit too strong. It, this is Bhante Sujata probably playing around and having a good time yeah, and come, coming up with some words. Uh, but the idea here of this kind of uh, observation, this kind of examination of the body is to neutralize the attraction. It is not to hate your own body. Yeah, that is not the point. Uh, some people already have a very bad relationship with their body because they think they are too fat or they think that this or that or it isn't right or whatever. Uh, but if you have a good relationship with your body, it is good to neutralize the attraction a little bit. And this is the entire purpose of this particular exercise, to neutralize the desire, seeing the body a little bit more for what it actually is. The body just isn't that interesting, yeah? And it's amazing how we can be so attracted to these bodies. And the point of all of this, and this exercise also you see in the Satipatthana Sutta, this is one of the core exercises in Satipatthana Sutta. This is a real meditation exercise. It belongs with the meditation. The purpose of all of this uh, is to make your mind ready for meditation practice. Uh, one of the main reasons why meditation is so difficult is because we are so attached to the body, the five senses, and that whole world. Uh, yeah, and so this one here, this particular exercise is to help you let go a little bit of the body. And when you let go a little bit of the body, it enables meditation to happen. Yeah? That is why this exercise is found at the beginning of the Satipatthana Sutta, is find, found under Kaya Nupassana, the contemplation of the body. It is there because it is there that it is useful at the beginning to overcome some of the hindrances that block meditation from happening here. So this is what this really is about. So how do we do this? And this is actually also quite interesting. And this is where I want to point out how we sometimes go wrong in our understanding because the uh, Theravada interpretation sometimes is not quite accurate to the suttas. And you will notice the critical word here for going, for understanding how to do this, uh, is this word examines. Uh, yeah, at the very beginning, uh, you have furthermore is highlighted and the third, third word after that, examines. Uh, this is the critical word. Uh, and the Pali word for examines is pacha vekati. Pacha vekati means to, um, to examine, to investigate, yeah, uh, to, um, uh, yeah, something like that, to examine or investigate or to, to look at something clearly. Yeah? And this word examine is quite different from the word which me usually means to observe or to look on something. Yeah? If you want to see the word which is observing or looking on, uh, it is often used in a different way. That is often anupasi, yeah to just be aware, anupasana, to look along with it. So the word examines here is actually more of an imaginative process. It's using your mind to understand the nature of the body. So you imagine the body, you imagine its nature in your mind. You use your mind's eye to see what the body is like. Yeah? You, maybe you take the body apart in, in your mind. You remember that, okay, here, oh, skull. I can feel the skull is right here, yeah? Right? People think skulls are scary, but we carry skulls with us all the time. The skull is right here, for goodness sake. Skull is here, okay? Heart is in the, here, in the middle here somewhere. Maybe the liver is a bit down here. You have lungs on both sides, yeah? It's right here. And so you use your imagination to understand the nature of your own body. This is what examination means. And um, so this is how you do this exercise. It's basically an exercise in imagination. Now that is a very important point because one of the strange things about the Theravada tradition is that the idea that everything has to be seen directly Everything is about direct seeing, yeah? So you are watching the breath. Well, when we watch the breath, that is direct seeing because you're actually watching something in action happening right now. 
But then the Theravada tradition says that all of these exercises are about seeing things directly. Yeah, so seeing these parts of the body directly. And because that is what they say, they argue that to be able to see the parts of the body, you have to use the light of samadhi to penetrate inside your body and actually see these things as they, as they really are inside of your body. Some of the very famous meditation traditions yeah, actually argue that this is how you do this kind of meditation practice. Everything is about direct seeing. But actually, what we see here is that this is wrong, yeah? because the word pachavekati does not mean direct seeing. It means imagination, understanding what is happening inside of you through an act of imagination. So this is an alternative way of doing meditation practice, right? Meditation is not all about direct seeing. It is not all about direct insight into the nature of reality. In fact, insight does not always happen by seeing things directly. Insight can happen in many different ways. It can happen through an act of imagination. It can happen through an act of inference. After the fact, understanding what is going on. That is another way of achieving insight. So what this means is that meditation is much more diverse than what you sometimes get the feeling in meditation circles. It is true, it is about direct seeing, it is about observing directly what is going on, but that is only one way of doing meditation. A second way is using imagination. This is what we are seeing here. We will see more of this further down because we come to the cemetery contemplations, all of that. That too is about, direct, about using imagination. And third, it is about using not direct seeing, but inference. We infer that something is the case, yeah? And this is a third way of doing it. For example, an example of using inference is that when you see that your own body consists of 31 parts that are not very attractive, you infer other people's body too have 31 parts. It's logical, right? It's very hard to avoid that conclusion, but it is not direct experience because you don't directly experience the, the bodies of others. It is an inference that you make based on your own experience, based on seeing dead bodies, based on reading books that show you the parts of the bodies, all of this kind of thing. Three ways of doing meditation practice. This goes against the standard Theravada way of thinking about meditation. And for that reason, it is very significant to understand this difference. Meditation is not just about direct seeing. It is much more broad than that. And this right here is an example of that. So again, I am making this point, and I'm kind of making a lot out of it, because uh, it is important to understand how trapped we can be by tradition how trapped we can be by commentaries uh, when the reality actually turns out to be quite different from what we think. Uh, this is one such example. Then. Okay, let us look at the uh, simile. There's a simile coming up just to uh, finish off this one. There's a next paragraph there. And uh, this is the simile. So it is as if there were a bag with openings at both ends. Uh, filled with various kinds of grains, such as fine rice, wheat, mung beans, peas, sesame, and ordinary rice. And someone with good eyesight were to open it and examine the contents. These grains are fine rice. These are wheat. These are mung beans. These are peas. These are sesame. These are ordinary rice. And it's in the same way, a mendicant examines their own body up from the soles of the feet, down from the tips of the hair, wrapped in skin and full of many kinds of impurities. Yeah, and then it comes the long list of impurities. And as they live like this, or as they, in this case, meditation is more suited word, as they meditate like this, diligent, keen and resolute, the memories and thoughts of the lay life are given up. 
the mind becomes stilled internally. It settles, unifies, and becomes stilled in samadhi. That, too, is how mendicant develops mindfulness of the body. Yeah. So this simile, it adds a few extra ideas. Yeah? And one of the ideas here is that, of course, this, uh, the content that you are seeing here, yeah, the grains, the rice, the wheat, and all of these kind of things, uh, these are not repulsive things. Uh, they are just ordinary things. If you see mung beans, or you see sesame, or you see rice, you are never repelled by that. Uh, it is not a problem, yeah? It is just neutral. You know that they are there, and because you know that they are there, you understand the content of what is going on. Uh, and this gives you an idea that the purpose of this exercise is not to be repelled by the body. If you get too repelled, you just end up committing suicide, and then you commit suicide, and you get reborn again afterwards. What a waste, right? Don't commit suicide because you are repelled by the body. See the content for what they actually are. It's a neutral kind of thing. And you feel more neutralized when you do this. The mind becomes more even. Instead of becoming repelled and averse and getting all kind of negative states of mind, it evens the mind out because you have less attraction. You have less desire for these kind of things. There's less agitation, less restlessness inside. And you get a beautiful mind state that is ready for meditation practice. That is the purpose of this practice here. Don't take it too far. There is a a story in the uh, suttas, which is kind of very, an amazing story to think about it. Uh, it's kind of very strange to really fully understand. Uh, this is a sutta which is found in the Vinaya Pitaka. And I know the contents of the Vinaya very well because I have actually translated the Vinaya Pitaka. And one of the uh, stories there, this is a story that is behind one of the rules. Uh, and this is the rule about not being allowed to kill a human being, yeah? This is kind of the rule that is the background for this. And in this background story, the Buddha started by teaching this kind of contemplation, yeah? The asuba, the non-beauty or the, the filth or the impurity meditation. And then the Buddha went on retreat. And when the Buddha went on retreat, all these monks, they did so much asuba meditation, they get so fed up of the body, they wanted to die. They wanted to kill the body. Yeah? And then the Buddha came out and said, what's going on? What happened to all the monks? Oh, they all died dead because they were too much asuba practice. <laughs> it's a very strange story. And it's very hard to really understand exactly what is going on. And then the Buddha said, OK, I will give you a different meditation object. And the meditation object the Buddha gave them was mindfulness of breathing. Yeah, that is the importance of mindfulness of breathing. It is the neutral meditation in the middle. So this kind of practice that we're seeing here should be used as a support to mindfulness of breathing. It should not be taken too far. It should be used as something to neutralize the mind, not to hate your body or to feel aversion to the world. Don't take it too far. Know the limits. And if you feel that this sort of meditation is not for you, that is perfectly OK. Most people do not do this kind of meditation. You can just forget about it. And you can stay with the mindfulness of breathing. And perhaps you can do the element meditation instead, because the element meditation is the next one. And that we will talk about tomorrow. So I will just give you a. Heads up, what is coming tomorrow? It's a commercial, so you know what's happening tomorrow. We're going to look at the elements meditation. And uh, that's it for now.